Holly O'Neill, and I'm going to be assisting with the moderation for tonight's event, along with Rosie. And I want to start just by acknowledging that the focus of our forum tonight, which is the South Fork Nooksack Watershed, is a traditional is the traditional territory of the Nooksack Indian Tribe, who have lived here since time immemorial and remain a sovereign nation today. And for those of us who are settlers in the South Fork, and that includes me, we express gratitude to the Nooksack Indian tribe for inviting us to learn about their continued stewardship of this land and for their leadership in protecting this watershed uh, upon which we all rely. So I wanna give honor to that. And I wanna thank you all for being here tonight. It's really, I am so excited for this forum. <laughs> we have been waiting a long time to hear this research. We've heard some of the framing from Oliver before, but this is like the grand reveal of so much work on the part of Susan Dickerson Lang. And I'm just totally thrilled to get to, to hear about it in part because you know, if you've if you've been around the, the forest industry or, or forest management for a long time, you know that that this it's an art and a science and an industry that is always changing, right? It has been changing forever and, and we keep on learning new things. And as we learn new things, then we do it better. We can understand how to manage our resources for multiple uses and for future generations. And so tonight is really a time when we're gonna get to hear some of the more, um, some really sophisticated uh, ideas about how we can think about our watershed and how forestry can really benefit multiple uses. So I'm gonna just go through really briefly what our agenda is. Hold on, let me try the share screen. And ta -da! There we go. So we're gonna have Oliver talk first about just kind of giving us a framework for the tribe's climate action research. And then we'll have Susan talking about her studies with the South Fork Nooksack Forest Hydrology. After we've heard both from, from Oliver and from Susan, we'll do Q and A. So at any point during tonight, you can type your questions into the chat box and I'll be monitoring that and then reflecting back and we'll do kind of like a panel, a panel moderation and hear from, from Oliver and Susan on that. And then we'll wrap it up before eight o'clock and I'll tell you about the upcoming forum. So a couple of logistics, as I said, you can use the chat box. Uh, I, you know, there's probably gonna be more questions than we'll have time to answer tonight. So if you write them in the chat box and I don't get to them, then we'll make sure to include them in an FAQ that'll go on the website after the meeting. And just a reminder that we are recording the webinar. Thanks to Bellingham TV in particular for their help with that. Really appreciate their support for our work. And then we post the videos, we put them in nice little clips. So if it's not like one big two hour things, you can watch those at your leisure and they'll be on the South Fork uh, Nooksack River Community Watershed Project website. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> Someday we got to shorten that website name. At any rate, there we go. So that's the plan for tonight. We're going to stop share. I'm going to introduce Oliver and uh, I hope you all just have a great time. So Mr. Graw, are you ready? Holly, I am ready. Okay, great. I'm going to put the spotlight on you and uh, you please go ahead and start. Okay, am I sharing my screen? Yes, you are. Okay, and let me start the slideshow. And is it in slideshow uh, format? Let's take a look. Not yet. Okay. Try again. How about now? Mm -mm. So open, open let your slideshow. Okay, it's and open. Then, and then hit the green share screen at the bottom. I did do that. Try it again. Okay, just a moment. No rush. It's, it's just part of this online world. Yep. Okay, I'll try it again. There it's, we go. It's coming. Okay. Okay. 
How about now? Okay, now hit the slideshow. Oh, we went through this before. Yeah, it's always different each time. Okay, now it should be in slideshow format. Okay. Is that correct? You got it. Hey, participants, can you chat chat to me now? Can you see? You should see like a beautiful picture of the mountains and Oliver's face. And if you, by the way, if you toggle, there's like a you can click on that little thing between Oliver and the slideshow and make him bigger or him smaller. If you scroll that like to the right and left, just so you know, if you want to adjust it. Yay, thank you guys. Thank you everybody for, okay, Oliver, you're on. Okay, okay here we go. So um, the topic of my presentation is uh, watershed restoration and climate change, bringing land use and upper watershed processes into focus in the South Fork Nooksack River watershed. And it's not advancing. Why is that? Okay, I'll do it this way. There we go. Okay, so um, the objectives of this presentation include identifying the scope and context of the climate change program, the history of the climate change program, important importance of focus on upper watershed processes, and focus on knowledge gaps that must be filled to address land use and management, watershed health, water supply, water quality, and climate change and also discuss or identify possible solutions. And that'll be one of the topics of Susan's presentation. Um, there's many um, co-investigators and partners and collaborators on the tribe's climate change program. Too many to list individually, but we, they're all valued and have substantially contributed uh, to this climate change project. And many of you are in the audience tonight. Uh, sources of funding include um, the EPA, um, the Performance Partnership Grant, and the National Estuary Program Grant, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Tribal Climate Resilience Program Grant, and Rights Protection Grants, the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission Grants, North Pacific Land State Conference Conservation Cooperative Grants, and Washington Department of Ecology National Estuary Program Grant Program for Riparian Restoration and Protection in Ag Lands. So the basis of the Nooksack Indian Tribe climate, tra climate Change Project includes establishing first baseline conditions against which to um, discern climate change impacts. And baseline conditions really include consideration of both natural conditions and legacy impacts. And why? Well, this would be an example of natural conditions, and but you also need to consider the effect of legacy land uses on um, the existing condition. And, and really what you want to focus on are cumulative impacts of legacy impacts combined with climate change impacts. And don't underestimate the importance of identifying, characterizing and quantifying existing legacy impacts in conducting vulnerability assessments and adaptation planning. So once you identify natural conditions and legacy impacts um, as reference points, then you uh, factor in climate change impacts to identify cumulative impacts of, of natural conditions, legacy impacts, and climate change impacts. And once you've um, established cumulative impacts, then you look at vulnerability assessments. What are the impacts of both climate change and um, natural conditions and legacy impacts on the vulnerability of certain species and communities? You develop adaptation plans to build resilience in species and communities and um, identify adaptation um, tools that could help um, those entities persist into the future. And then you, and you develop these adaptation plans for fish habitat, fish, wildlife, indigenous foods, water supply, and water quality. And so our project doesn't just focus on climate change, it actually focuses also on legacy impacts and legacy impacts are impacts that have occurred due to land management in the watershed, both past and current land management. They also, the project also includes treaty resources, um, endangered species recovery, such as the Spring Chinook salmon in the South Fork River, as well as Clean Water Act compliance, all in one single holistic project. So the Nooksack watershed includes the South Fork, Middle Fork, North Fork, Nooksack Rivers, and the focus tonight is on the South Fork. And so why the South Fork? Well, it's the second largest fork, 192 square miles. It has its lowest elevation is 220 feet at the confluence with the North Fork and tops out at about 7,000 feet on the Sisters Range. Um, 
the watershed generally lacks glacial ice and there's minimal summer ice melt component to the flow in the river. And it's the most heavily impacted by land use of the Three Forks. And it has frequent Clean Water Act standard exceedances for temperature and sediment. And um, the, the climate change modeling we accomplished for the river suggests that uh, the South Fork Nooksack River um, serves as a good surrogate for what the conditions might be like in 2075 for the North Fork and the Middle Fork River. So conditions today in the South Fork might give an indication of what the conditions will be like in the North Fork and Middle Fork um, later in the century. Um, and so why do we care about the South Fork? Well, it's the salmon in the river from the tribe's perspective. And there's nine species of Pacific salmon um, in, the, uh, in the watershed. Uh, three species are protected under the Endangered Species Act. And Spring Chinook salmon are of particular value to the Nooksack tribe for subsistence, cultural, ceremonial, and commercial uses. Um, flows in the river are, have been declining, particularly during the summer and fall months. Typically, state mandated minimum stream flows are currently not met approximately 220 days out of the year. Um, if you take climate change into consideration, uh, stream flows will likely decrease by 70% in 2075 due to climate change. And um, that could mean that could extend this period of deficiency in flow by an additional 70 days for a total of two, 290 days out of the year. So climate change will have a significant effect on stream flow. And it, from a regulatory standpoint, um, it will cause the river to not meet minimum in-stream flows for an approximate duration of 290 days. Um, there's significant water quality exceedances for temperature and sediment due to legacy land uses and natural causes. And all these factors have contributed to a large reduction in salmon stocks in the South Fork and have impeded recovery results. Today, native salmon runs are less than 8% of the runs in the late 1800s. And I was just talking to one of our fishery biologists, Ned Currents, just 45 minutes ago, and he was updating this and, and suggests that today, as of this year, the runs are only closer to, or closer to only one to three, one to three percent of um, salmon stocks in the late 1800s. So it's kind of a dire situation. And for the tribe, this is a very important thing to focus on in terms of watershed management. And so um, just to summarize briefly, um, some monumental projects that we've been involved with that lead up to the, the research that Susan's gonna be presented on. And these include, first of all, um, the South Fork Nooksack River Temperature Total Maximum Daily Load Project. And in August, the tribe, August 2011, the tribe provided comments to Washington Department of Ecology and EPA Region 10 on the scope of the TMDL project. And a TMDL is an evaluation process and a regulatory tool to help bring an impaired water body into compliance with state and federal Water Quality Act standards. In the case of the South Fork, non-point source pollution predominates. Non-point source pollution is not subject to regulatory action, only voluntary actions. Um, the tribe, at the start of this TMDL project, the tribe was concerned that the TMDL would not directly address upland watershed processes, legacy impacts, climate change, reasonable natural conditions. And we didn't want the TMDL to just focus on compliance with the Clean Water Act numeric criteria, but more importantly, focus on the designated or beneficial use of the South Fork Nooksack River, and that's fish and fish habitat. Uh, the South Fork Temperature TMDL identified the potential tool of a watershed conservation plans, plan as a means to address non-point source pollution. No regulatory requirements to address, no regulatory requirements to address non-point source pollution um, was in the TMDL uh, because again, um, the regulatory bite of the Clean Water Act is primarily point sources like say from a, um, a, a sewage treatment plant outfall into receiving waters. Um, it deferred, the TMDL deferred addressing non-point source pollution to the community. Um, after a long process, the final TMDL was released in February of 2020. Um, 
our comments on a component of the TMDL, the implementation plan included that a plan, it, well, first of all, the implementation plan is a plan how to address the non-point source pollution issue to bring the help water body back into compliance. Um, it's acquired element of the TMDL and the South Fork TMDL implementation plan lacked detail in our opinion. It deferred development of implementation detail to the South Fork Nooksack River community for monitoring and adaptive management after five years. And it suggests that local stakeholders be responsible for developing the plan, detail, implementation, and monitoring. The TMDL assumed compliant forestry in the watershed had no influence on water quantity, water quality, or the consideration, or the consideration in the TMDL. Um, primarily, primary focus on the impact, primarily focused on the impacts of agriculture, community development, transportation, and flood control as the primary human influences on temperature exceedances. Little information was presented in the, in the implementation plan on upper watershed land uses because of the non-point source, source pollution not being regulated. And minimal information on how forestry could be engaged to participate in addressing the non-point source pollution that might be a source of the pollution problem. So concurrently with implementing the TMDL project, um, EPA Office of Research and Development was developing a pilot research project that integrated climate change into a temperature TMDL. EPA was searching for a TMDL project and decided to apply the pilot research project to the South Fork Nooksack River watershed. The pilot research project was designed to support the TMDL project in reducing the impact of high stream temperatures on salmon as well as climate change. But more importantly, support both salmon recovery and Clean Water Act compliance by focusing on what salmon habitat restoration actions would be needed to promote salmon survival in the face of climate change at fish populations levels that provide for har harvestable surpluses. And so, um, it was a collaboration between EPA Office of Research and Development, EPA Region 10 out of Seattle, the Nooksack Indian Tribe, Washington Department of Ecology, and Tetra Tech, the, the primary consultant um, um, contracted by Ecology and EPA. But it's not wasn't just a technical project, but it was also a story of converging and integrating project pathways, voluntary collaboration, particularly on the part of the tribe, in my opinion, and the co-production of actionable climate change science. And, and I think Susan's research is an example of co-production of actionable climate change science. In any case, the tribe had substantial impact on the outcome of the federal research project and the TMDL regulatory program for the South Fork Nooksack River. Um, and it's also an example of where circumstance meets opportunity to yield EPA Region 10 Climate Change and TMDL Pilot Research Project. It's the first temperature TM TMDL project in the U.S. to directly and functionally address climate change as an important factor in the TMDL process. The tribe's focus on reasonable natural conditions allowed the final TMDL to be released to the public in 2020, while all other TMDLs in preparation in Washington and Oregon were on hold barring the results of litigation over assumed natural conditions. And I like to think that part of the reason why um, the South Fork TMDL was issued to the public in 2020 was because of our hyper focus on reasonable natural conditions in that project. In any case, um, even though the qualitative or the, the EPA uh, climate change pilot research project was designed and implemented to um, to support the TMDL. Um, it couldn't wait to be published, and it was finally published in February of 2017, well in advance of the release of the TMDL project. So it was kind of out of order. Um, key messages included that it identified and prioritized um, Endangered Species Act climate change adaptation strategies or recovery actions for the South Fork that explicitly include climate change as a risk. Um, it was based on um, methodology in the scientific literature, primarily Beachy et al. 2013, and utilized an interdisciplinary team comprised of federal, tribal, state, local, and local watershed authority to develop research pilot demonstration and complete the assessment. Um, 
EPA um, Office of Research Development, um, um, again, led this climate change pilot research project. Uh, tribal staff were the authors of the qualitative assessment report published by the EPA, and the primary authors were myself, uh, Treva Co, Mike Modlin, Ned Currents, and Jezra Below. Uh, the publication focused on Clean Water Act compliance, climate change impacts on fish, vulnerability assessment, and adaptation planning and resilience. Uh, it's the first EPA publication with tribal staff as senior authors, so I was told. Um, so the qualitative assessment included, again, evaluating climate change impacts in the South Fork Nooksack watershed, um, determining the vulnerability of species and communities to those climate change impacts. In other words, evaluate species impacts, um, evaluate actions and tools such as restoration techniques, so on and so forth, that might reduce the vulnerability of species or reduce the level of impact of climate change on those species and communities. And then make recommendations on the specific tools that might be most effective in um, facilitating or perpetuating the species into the future with climate change and building resilience in those species. And so the, the typical set of um, restoration tools and approaches to build resilience in the watershed and address the, the specific needs of fish include reconnecting the river to this floodplain, restoring riparian areas, continue in-stream rehabilitation and restoration, and including build more of them bigger and faster, um, restore flow regimes, promote longitudinal connectivity. Again, some of this is kind of technical terms. Don't worry about, um, about them if you don't fully understand them. Uh, reconnect floodplains to the river, reduce sediment delivery. And in terms of the typical approach towards addressing climate change, continue in-stream rehabilitation restoration, the climate change um, pilot research project and the qualitative assessment came to the conclusion that these Typical approaches, i.e. building engineered log jams, um, uh, restoring riparian areas, so on and so forth, were not particularly effective against uh, climate change. Um, how about restoring flow regimes? Rarely um, are, is this tool considered in watershed restoration. However, um, it, it, in its relevance as a tool will be shown in Susan's presentation. Um, additional actions include, again, um, well, before we get into additional action, I want to make the point that, again, the traditional um, watershed restoration approach is to focus on the floodplain, the riparian zone, and the water body without much regard to the upper watershed. So we all need to start acknowledging and addressing the role of upper watershed processes in main stem river flows and water quality and fish habitat. Um, Another action is to develop a watershed conservation plan that includes tools that promote watershed resilience in the face of climate change. Design and implement watershed restoration tools that support and supplement traditional in-stream tools. And this all involves voluntary actions throughout the watershed on the part of forestry, transportation, agriculture, development, and government. So again, um, I mentioned the South Fork Nooksack River Watershed Conservation Plan. There's some basic there we want to cover. Uh, both the South Fork TMDL and the EPA Climate Change Pilot Research Project recommended that a comprehensive watershed conservation plan be developed that address legacy impacts, water quality impairments, climate change, and taking community values and interests into consideration. An intensive and extensive public outreach and stakeholder engagement process was implemented in preparing the plan, and Holly um, did an incredible job leading that effort. And a draft plan was produced in 2017, and we are currently updating the plan for release uh, this next month in May. And we used initially the Handbook for Developing Watershed Plans to Restore and Protect Our Waters, uh, developed by the EPA, but we, we came across some, well, we came up with some conclusions about the utility of that particular handbook. And so um, it's, a, it's guidance that's supposed to address both point and non-point pollution, 
but its focus is on urban and suburban watersheds with a predominance of point pollution, which is not the case in the South Fork. It's a, it's a rural watershed with primarily non-point source pollution. Um, it focuses, the focus of the handbook is on non, excuse me, focus of addressing non-point pollution is treating the impaired water body through in-stream structures, riparian restoration, almost no focus on upper watershed away from the water body. Almost no guidance on forested and natural resource-based watersheds with non-point source pollution. Essentially promotes a knowledge gap on the influence of natural resource management in watershed on stream flows. So in terms of our uh, South Fork, uh, watershed conservation planning effort. We developed a planning team um, back in about 2014. We developed a concept. We um, informed the YRA1 initiating governments um, on our efforts of watershed planning in the South Fork. Um, we formed interest groups, including recreation, forestry, fishers, agriculture, transportation, and recreation, as well as government. We expanded the planning team to include these um, interest groups. We held a public meeting in Van Zant and had quite a bit of, out, uh, of, of interest in that meeting. A lot of uh, public comment was given. And we, in, we went back to the um, interest groups to inform them on the results of the meeting. And we processed that information and we formed um, an ad hoc watershed committee that watershed committee uh, met seven times to discuss the development of the watershed conservation plan and provide comments on the initial draft of the watershed conservation plan. The draft plan was developed in 2017, as I already mentioned. It got some review from the uh, watershed committee as well as other interested parties. We continued to do research on the issues synthesize science and in, incorporate in community needs to develop a final plan, which is currently being produced in May. Um, so there's the missing piece of the overall restoration puzzle. And again, I've indicated that the primary focus is on the water body, the riparian zone and um, the floodplain. But what really needs to be done is to focus restoration enhancement of watershed hydrologic function on the upper watershed, not just on the floodplain riparian zone and the river itself. So why focus on upland watershed processes? Well, the convention in watershed restoration is to focus on the water body, riparian buffer and floodplain, as I've already indicated, without much focus on the upper watershed. But most of our watersheds in Western Washington are forested with commercial forestry, the primary land use. In Washington, the Forest Practices Act primarily focuses on water quality with very little focus on water quantity. Where it does focus on water quantity, it includes reference to hydrologic maturity, however, not routinely addressed or considered in Forest Practices Act permitting. And hydrologic maturity uh, means mature vegetation has a canopy closure of 70% or more in a diameter of nine inches or more. That does not sound like a mature stand of trees to me. Um, this study, su study suggests that this definition of hydrologic maturity is unreasonable. Um, there's some focus in the Forest Practices Act on peak flows and flooding, but not low flows. Um, but what about base flows during low flow season, typically the most critical time for fish and water availability for other beneficial uses? There's apparently no consideration in the Washington Forest Practices Act of these potential influences. So modified management of our watersheds should be considered to address the cumulative impact of legacy land uses and continued future climate change on stream flow, including water supply. However, legislative action would be required to update the Forest Practices Act to address the likely influence of forest harvest on late summer stream flows. So what is the basis of concern over the influence of forest harvest on summer low flows? Well, research starting in the late 1800s through today shows that there is an influence of forest management on stream flow. Typically, the focus is on increased annual yield but not on the timing of flow increase or flow decrease, such as base flows in the summer. Generally, forest harvest increases annual water yield through higher peak flows, but results in a narrower, narrower hydrograph base with reduced summer flows. 
Research in the Pacific Northwest suggests that timber harvest has an influence on late summer stream flows. In a paired watershed study, uh, found that forest harvest in the age of regeneration has substantive influence on the hydrology of the watershed. And this comes from Perry and Jones, 2016. They found that base flows in log watersheds may be reduced by 50% compared to watersheds with predominantly mature and old growth stands. The log watersheds show no sign of recovery from prolonged depletion of um, late summer stream flows in watersheds logged 40 to 50 years ago compared to unlogged watersheds with mature old growth forest stands. Many factors are involved, but the higher transpiration rates of regenerating young forests compared to older forests appears to be the primary factor involved with the late summer flow reduction. Um, similar research in the Oregon Cascades by Segura et al. also suggests that timber harvest has an influence on reduced late summer flows. Cobble et al. evaluated several watersheds um, in Oregon, Northern California, and Idaho and found variability in how stream responds to forest harvest. They found decreased low flow was observed years after harvest in 16 of the 25 watersheds studied. Um, so in our literature review, we found no specific information or research on the influence of forest management in the Nooksack River watershed. Given the importance of water supply in the watershed, we should know about such influences if they occur. And this suggests that we have a significant relevant knowledge gap on potential influence of forest harvest in the Nooksack River watershed. So through literature review on these topics, we have identified this knowledge gap in regard to how commercial forestry might influence late summer stream flows in the Nooksack River watershed. Current forest harvest regulations do not address this knowledge gap as I already established. It's not reasonable to assume that the same relationship between old growth and young regenerating stands influence on stream flow in Oregon directly applies here in the Nooksack River watershed. As such, we identified the obvious hypothesis that needs to be tested through scientific inquiry. And that hypothesis is commercial forest harvest in the Nooksack River watershed has an influence on late summer stream flow. We developed a, water, a research project to address this knowledge gap and test this hypo hypothesis. And I say we developed, it was the collaborative team between many entities that, um, that have contributed to this research project. Hey, Oliver, Oliver, yeah. if you could, you, that was the most fascinating slide. In fact, these last couple have been so great. Could you go back one and slow down? You have enough time. And I, I think this is really important because it's so, um, you're just you're um, laying out a lot of great content. So you, you have time. Slow down. Uh, this slide. Yeah. Okay. Just pause. <laughs> okay. okay. Let us let us digest for a minute here. Gee, Holly, you've never told me that I have more time. I was, <laughs> I was, I was expecting you to pull up the uh, hook and pull me off the stage. I think you can hear the clock ticking or something, but you're fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, in any case, we identified this uh, knowledge gap. And we thought this knowledge gap would direct, directly relate to conditions in the South Fork Nooksack River, mm -hmm. um, also relate to water supply, both for fish and downstream water users. Um, as I indicated, the, um, the Washington State Forest Practices Act uh, do not address this knowledge gap or doesn't consider the possibility that commercial forestry has an impact on late summer stream flows. And, and also, it's all this research that I've cited comes out of Central Oregon, and it's not reasonable to assume that that those relationships um, established in Central Oregon directly apply to the Nooksack River. And so, through scientific inquiry, we applied where we we identified the hypothesis to be tested, and that's commercial forest harvest in the Nooksack River watershed has an influence on late summer stream flows. And as a collaborative team, we developed a research project to address this knowledge gap and test this hypothesis. Okay. Um, so Got evaluation it. of potential forest management influences on stream flow could inform us on strategies to facilitate late summer stream flows that address and potentially offset the added impact of continued climate change on stream flows, as well as current and future water demand. 
The tribe and collaborators have recently completed such a pilot research project using BIA grant funding to model the effect of forest management on late summer stream flows in the South Fork and thus test the, the um, hypothesis identified above. And that's why we're looking so forward to Susan Dickerson Lang's presentation coming up in a couple moments. And it's a collaboration between the tribe, Natural Systems Design, which um, Susan is um, employed by, Western Washington University, University of Washington, um, and, and Washington Water Trust. This also includes modeling snow accumulation and melt dynamics to identify enhancement opportunities through small gap cuts compared to standard expansive clear cuts. And it also involves developing a pilot watershed services exchange project for water saved or produced water that would come from a, a, a change in forest management through voluntary modifications of commercial forestry to monetize the produced water. Interesting um, conclusion we've tentatively come to is that it would take legislative action to give this produced water protection status. In other words, any water that is produced through a change in management of the watershed becomes part of the water rights seniority scheme um, that currently makes up the state of Washington water rights management program. So kind of in closing here, so um, I've mentioned that there, you know, we're evaluating opportunities to um, modify or, or suggest or identify how um, forest management could be modified to address some of these issues. And it would all be voluntary at this point in time. There'd be no regulatory teeth to any recommendations we made, but we're sincere about the possibility of this influence of commercial forestry and stream flow. And so the best way to act on these opportunities is to take control or purchase or have management control um, over an area. And so that brings us to the Stewart Mountain Community Forest Initiative. And so the relevance and utility of a community forest in addressing legacy impacts as well as climate change impacts were recognized in the South Fork Watershed Conservation Plan, the TMDL and the EPA Climate Change Pilot Research Project, which I highlighted before. The tribe has been a founding member in the development of the Stewart Mountain Community Forest that aims to address water quality and flow issues in the South Fork, as well as offset forecast climate change impacts. Uh, forest land ownership and or management control through a community forest would allow a shift in forest management to facilitate produced water and stream flow enhancement without requiring uh, legislative action. And so the watershed planning process mentioned previously has led to this team focus on establishing a community forest on the east side of Stewart Mountain in the South Fork watershed. And in 2017, a timber management investment organization called Conservation Forestry purchased 12,000 acres on Stewart Mountain. Conservation Forestry approached our watershed planning team with an offer to sell about half of their holding on Stewart Mountain, about 6,000 acres to establish a community forest. Uh, the, the Stewart Mountain Community Forest would be owned by the community and managed as a working forest that balances a wide variety of ecological, economic, and community benefits. Some of the primary objectives of the community forest will be to restore natural watershed functions, increase summer stream flows, improve water quality, and recover salmon populations through improved or modified forest management practices. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to Susan and we, I anxiously await to hear from her on the results of her excellent pilot research project for the South Fork Nooksack River. And with that, thank you very much. And I will sign off from being a presenter. Thank you. Unmute. Great. That was fantastic, Oliver. Yes. That was so much great information. And I love, I'm seeing some uh, questions and comments in the chat. So thank you all for that. That's, that's wonderful. Um, Oliver, I'm going to have you stop. Uh, sharing your screen, if you can do that. Okay, let's see. Now I just ask, it's only, oh, there it is, stop share. There's the button. There you go. Okay. There okay. Go. okay. Great. And we're going to transition over to Susan. Susan, so glad you're here. And if you want to go ahead and um, 
uh, introduce yourself maybe, and then we'll just get started with your presentation. Everybody, this is a fine moment to stretch if you need to, <laughs> as Rosie said, grab your, uh, your pet and your blanket. Here we go. We're gonna get to hear the, about the pilot study. Okay, Susan, you're up. Fantastic, thanks so much. Um, can you share it, see my screen, Holly, and see me okay? Yeah. Everybody in the All chat systems go. on the attendees, can you see Susan's screen okay and see her? Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. All right. Great. Super. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here and um, particularly thankful for all the folks here who have contributed to this study. Um, there's lots and lots of folks I particularly want to call out, uh, not only Oliver and Holly, but also Bob Mitchell, who's in the audience, who's really a um, co-author uh, co of a lot of this modeling work. Um, I also wanted to call out, uh, we have lots of great partners who've contributed uh, to this effort and we could not do it without their input and support. All right, great. So by way of background, um, I first got really interested in the hydrology of the Nooksack River watershed when I was a grad student at Western. I actually worked with Bob Mitchell as my advisor, so it has been a real pleasure to circle back around and collaborate with him on this project now. Um, and we started looking at the effects of climate change on stream flow in the Nooksack River Basin um, and in the South Fork in particular. And um, what I'm showing here is some work that Ryan Murphy and Bob Mitchell did to together to look at what the effects of climate change are anticipated to be on stream flow in the South Fork Nooksack. So this is a graph of stream flow through time starting in October and going through September. Hydrologists think a little bit differently. We start and end with the dry season. Uh, and the black graph is a typical hydrograph over history where we see a peak in the winter uh, due to rainfall and uh, heavy precipitation that dips down a little bit. We see another peak in the spring from snowmelt that then contributes to summer flow. As we look at climate change effects on stream flow in the South Fork Nooksack, what we see is a collapsing of those two peaks as we lose the ability of the watershed to store water as snow. And so we get more flows in the winter and we have less snow melts and thus less summer flow. And that's really the crux of what we're looking at today is we are anticipating reduced flows in the summer, which has implications for in-stream flows as well as out of stream uses um, and also has implications for water quality and particularly for increased stream temperatures. Um, and so that really motivates a lot of this work to think about and think creatively about how we can address and buffer some amount of these anticipated effects for the benefit of the entire community. Um, and within the South Fork Nooksack River watershed, it's a beautiful watershed. As you all know, I love spending time there. Uh, it's full of the agriculture and agricultural valleys. The top photo is uh, looking north through that valley in the Black Slough area. Beautiful forests. Uh, the bottom photo is looking out at the Sisters Range um, and just a gorgeous forested watershed. And if we look at the land ownership of this watershed, we note that it's not heavily developed. It's not heavily urbanized. It's very forested. The brown areas are private timberlands that are being managed actively for timber. The blue areas in the map are areas that are DNR state lands, many of which are being managed for timber. And then that big green section uh, in the upper right is the national forest. And so we wanted to ask the question, how does this upper watershed and this landscape of land ownership and land cover relate to stream flow? And what does that mean from the standpoint of climate change adaptation? So that brings us uh, to the approach. So from a water balance perspective, just zooming way out, we're thinking about how vegetation and the management of vegetation and particularly forests affects the water budget in the South Fork Nooksack. Uh, so from a water budget perspective, we have water come in as precipitation, and then we have water that leaves the watershed as evaporation and transpiration, or I usually just put them together and say evapotranspiration. But that's the evaporation from soil surfaces, leaf surfaces, water bodies, as well as the evaporation of water from leaf surfaces during the process of transpiration uh, to support photosynthesis. 
And then there's the storage component, water is stored as snow and soil moisture. And all of these factors combined to determine summer stream flow. So to try to model this, to ask questions about this at the watershed scale, what we did is we used a um, computer model. We actually used two computer models. And there's both acronyms that I'm going to be using. So I just wanted to spell them out. The first one is called VELMA, which stands for Visualizing Ecosystem Land Management Assessments, um, and DHSVM, which is the Distributed Hydrology Soil Vegetation Model. And both of these models are physically based spatially explicit models, which basically means that we take a GIS map of the watershed and we use calculations of physical processes at a pixel scale to simulate that water balance. So we start with a digital elevation model, which is a GIS based map of the watershed. We bring in meteorology, air temperature, precipitation, we overlay that map with characteristics in the watershed, so the land cover in terms of the type and age of vegetation, the disturbance regime of vegetation, and the soils. What type of soils are they? How deep are they? How do they hold and release water? And then the model abstracts water for every pixel through time to simulate soil moisture, snow, and then ultimately stream flow to help us get at this question of late summer stream flow. And so our approach here is to take the land cover in the watershed. We're looking at a land cover database map of the South Fork watershed. You see lots of dark greens. Those are the forested areas. And use these models to test the effects of changes in land cover on snow, soil moisture, and stream flow. And as I get into those models, I want to point out the key parts of the, inf the key ways that vegetation influences the water budget that we are trying to represent in these models. And this is going to become important because we actually are using these two different models because they have two different strengths in terms of what they can represent. So we know that vegetation intercepts rain and snow. So by doing so, uh, it reduces the amount of precipitation coming into the watershed. Um, if you've ever hiked out or snowshoed out in the winter, you know, the big blobs of snow that can be falling down as things are melting and trees can intercept a lot of precipitation. We know that the presence of trees also modify the energy available for melting snow and for driving evaporation and transpiration, or ET for short, by shading the sun and sheltering from wind, which reduces the energy inputs available. We also know that the vegetation uses soil moisture through the process of transpiration, where the roots access soil moisture and bring it up to the leaf surfaces, where during that process, some of it evaporates and becomes water vapor returning to the atmosphere. And we also know that all of these processes change as a function of growth, management, and disturbance. And as we're talking about those, I'm talking about timber harvest is an obvious one. Oliver mentioned it extensively. But we all, there's other ways that the forest can be managed that affect these things, like silviculture uh, and wildfire. So silviculture on the left, this is an aerial photograph of the Cedar River watershed uh, near Seattle, where Seattle Public Utilities is actually cutting silvicultural gaps for the benefit of mar marbled murrelet habitat, um, as well as exploring what that might do to, to support water supply. So I went through that because I wanted to just point out that the two models represent these processes uh, in different ways. And some are good at some processes and some are good at other processes. And in this case, the DHSVM model is really good at the interception of precipitation and the energy balance, whereas that VELMA model is good at how vegetation grows and transpires as it grows. And so just to throw out kind of give you an overview of how we used each of these models. DHSVM has the capability to model the interception and shading of snow. And in particular, canopy gaps that are thought to retain snow, to accumulate more snow and to retain it later into the summer season. Um, I'm particularly passionate about this issue. I've spent a lot of years uh, empirically on collecting observations. And the data in Western Washington suggests that we get two or three times as much snow in gaps, and that it lasts on the order of two to 12 weeks longer. Uh, so these 
photos are from the same day in the Cedar River watershed in a gap and under a continuous forest. And that if we scale that up to the watershed scale, the DHSVM now has this uh, nifty little model component, which there's a little graphic of where we can represent these gaps in the model. And so this is a relatively new component um, and hasn't been widely implemented. It's been implemented in the Snoqualmie Basin pilot study uh, in which they put gaps in all of those neon green areas in the Snoqualmie Basin and found an increase of about eight to 11% in summer stream flow by late century based on introducing gaps in that snow zone. Um, but this model really allows us to ask this question about the effect of gaps on snow retention and ultimately on stream flow. The Velma model, on the other hand, allows us to look at how vegetation changes through time and specifically how transpiration rates changes as trees get uh, older as they are cut and then as they regrow. Um, we know from some observational studies of sap flux in trees, actually measuring the movement of sap through trees, that transpiration rates in trees are different based on tree age. So the plot that I'm showing here is from some work in Oregon where they measured sap flux and found that the transpiration rate of a 40 year old stand is three times higher um, than, uh, than a um, mature stand or a 300 plus year old stand. And so the Velma model, oh, uh, actually before I get to the Velma model, I also wanna say that the, the sap flux measurements, so, so those are individual trees or individual stands. Oliver also made reference to the fact that there's been watershed scale studies that have looked at, well, how does that scale to a watershed to affect stream flow? Um, and in one of these studies, uh, this is from the Segura paper, they looked at how much of a difference does it make in summer stream flow? And what they found is in this plot, this shows the compilation of seven different studies where depending on the percent clear cut, so that's the x-axis going from not clear cut to 100% clear cut, that the difference between summer stream flow between the harvested watershed and the old growth watershed is showing that there's less summer stream flow in the clear cut watershed relative to the old growth watershed on the order of 15 to 50% less in late summer. Taking that stand transpiration effect and scaling it up. And Velma, as a model, allows us to model how these transpiration rates vary through time to potentially capture this effect. So then the purpose of using these two models to test the effects of land cover on snow, soil moisture, and stream flow specifically was to use the DHSVM to look at how, how does uh, snow storage, the effect on snow storage from forest gaps. And we use the Velma model to try to characterize how different ages of trees based on different disturbance and harvest frequencies affect soil moisture storage and ultimately stream flow in both cases. Now, the models represent somewhat different things, which is why we used both. But as I mentioned before, they are somewhat similar in their structure. And we took a similar modeling approach with both. And in particular, as part of the model setup process, uh, we used a standard procedure to calibrate to observations. So within the South Fork Nooksack River watershed, we have some stream gauges that are maintained by the USGS and Department of Ecology. We also have one snow gauge up in um, the mountains, the Elbow Lake Snowtail Station. And what we do is we model historic conditions with existing land cover to see how close we can match observed data to give some confidence that our model can reproduce what we have observed in real life. And then in terms of an approach, the approach we used for both was an end member approach. And this is a common modeling approach, particularly in pilot studies like this one, where we are developing extreme experimental scenarios to explore the bounds of the maximum hydrologic response. And so the, the goal here, and I'll mention this several times as we're talking about it, is not necessarily to represent a realistic scenario or a plan to implement tomorrow, but rather to implement the most extreme option so that we understand how much, what's the direction of the effect and what's the 
ballpark maximum magnitude. So for example, in the gap scenarios I'm going to show, if we look at the national land cover database on the left, that's existing conditions. So that's what we run in the model as our baseline existing conditions. And then in our most extreme gap scenario, we took every coniferous pixel, so every pixel that has conifer forest on it that is above 700 meters in the snow zone, which is all of the area that's not masked out on the right, and we implemented 40 meter, 40 meter gaps in every single pixel, and that represents about a quarter of the watershed area. Not feasible, more than likely, probably not desirable, but gives us a sense of that end member. So what I'm going to do, oh, uh, just to reiterate, ignores feasibility. We're ignoring multiple objectives. We're not taking into consideration economic or other ecological objectives like carbon sequestration or habitat. But what we're trying to do is provide some bound on effects and some guidance for future refinement. So what I'm going to do is walk through, starting with the DHSVM and our forest gap model, and then I'll walk into a, through our VELMA model based on harvest scenarios, We'll talk at the, towards the end about effects from climate change, and then we'll kind of bring it all together. So as I mentioned, our end member scenario within the DHSVM is introducing gaps in every pixel with conifer forest above 700 meters, which is the approximate snow zone. And we are conceptualizing this as 40 meter diameter gaps in a 50 meter pixel. So what that ends up being is about half of the area of the pixel now has a gap in it. And in that gap, snow can accumulate and it's subsequently shaded from the sun. And so here are some results at the outlet of the watershed from implementing that extreme gap scenario. So this is uh, extracting a hydrograph from just a typical year. We do some analysis on precipitation and temperature to pull out typical years and wet years and dry years to do some comparison. We're looking at stream flow uh, or Q in cubic feet per second. And I'll note that this is on a log scale on the Y axis, um, which the advantage of plotting on a log scale is that it helps us see differences in the low flows rather than have them be washed out by the peak flows, which can dominate the graph if we put it on an arithmetic scale. The existing condition scenario is in brown and the gap 40 scenario is in green. And there's a light blue scenario called the gap 28 scenario, which is similar, but we just implemented smaller gaps that are about half the size as the 40 meter gaps. Um, and so what we see is that there's not much difference during the winter or the early spring and that the graphs start to diverge in the early summer and into the early fall, where we see more stream flow in the gap 40 scenario and we see that sustained through June, July, August and September into the onset of the next wet season. Now I'm going to take this same plot and zoom in um, and show you a what's called a residual plot, um, which is a little confusing at first, but it helps see difference. So in this one, what we're looking at is that gap 40 scenario and that value minus the existing condition. So we're just plotting the difference between the two scenarios through time to see what that magnitude of the difference is, because it's really hard to squint and see the distance between those lines in the traditional hydrograph. And so this green line is showing us the difference between the gap 40 scenario and the existing condition scenario. And what we see is we still what we saw in the hydrograph, we see flows go up in June, July, August, and we see a sustained increase of about 100 CFS during that time. Now, to, to parse this in one more way, we were looking at just a typical year, but the reason that we run 30 year simulations is because we're trying to understand the effect uh, with climate variability. We have dry years, we have wet years, we have warm years, we have cold years. This helps us understand how that effect uh, is robust or not through that variability. And so on the right hand side, we're looking at box plots of median August stream flow across all 30 years of the simulation. Um, and a box plot is giving us that distribution of values. So the dark, uh, the black bold line is the median of that whole group of values, 30 years times 31 daily values. 
the box is giving us the 25th to the 75th percentile. If you think about a bell curve, gives us the middle of that bell curve, and then the whiskers give us the outer range. And what we see is that we do see the median increasing in the gap 40 scenario relative to the existing condition scenario with a lot of interannual variability as well. But key takeaway here is down on the bottom right hand corner is that difference in those median values is about 25%. So for our most extreme scenario of putting gaps in the entire snow zone, we see a 25% increase in August stream flow relative to existing conditions. Now, with this pilot work, we implemented a few incremental scenarios that aren't end member scenarios just to start to get a handle on you know where are we should focus our efforts during the next phase and one of the things um, that we looked at which uh, is kind of interesting was looking at putting gaps introducing gaps as a function of land ownership so in this right hand picture this was the entire gap 40 scenario we put gaps in every pixel so then we also ran some scenarios where on the upper left hand side, we put gaps only in lands that are owned by the US Forest Service. So within that national forest, we introduce gaps only there and nowhere else. Uh, and we did the same thing with commercial timber gaps, as well as DNR lands. And you can see how those are distributed where the forest uh, gaps are all concentrated at that national forest, whereas the commercial timber gaps are spread out more in the watershed. And so we can look at the results and not surprisingly, the results for each one of those ownership scenarios is somewhere in between the existing conditions, this brown plot and that gap 40 extreme scenario that you've already seen. And so um, with that gap 40 scenario and the existing conditions that kind of brackets our difference and then these the ones in between show us where we are in between. But so they're all somewhere in between, but interestingly, we do see an effect based on elevation. So again, we're zooming in on a residual plot. So just to remind you, this is the difference between the experimental scenario and our baseline existing land cover. And this green line we saw before, that was the exact same one where we're seeing an increase from putting gaps in the entire snow zone relative to the existing conditions. But then these colors represent the different ownership scenarios. And interestingly, the, the orange one is those private timber lands, whereas the blue is that forest service scenario that we talked about. And they both have an effect on stream flow in June and July, but notice that the orange line tapers off into July, August, and September, whereas it's more sustained uh, in July, August, and September for the forest service gap scenario. And this we can directly trace to the elevation relationships where we have higher elevation gaps in the forest service um, zone. And so we get more snow lasting later into the year. So we see a different effect just based on where those gaps are in the landscape relative to the commercial timber gaps, which are at lower elevations in the landscape. Okay, so shifting gears from the forest gap scenarios in which we found in our most extreme scenario, a 25% increase in summer stream flow. Now we're gonna shift to the simulations where we looked at forest harvest effects. And for the Velma model to do this, what we did is we initiated the model with tree ages from LandTrender, which is a remote sensing satellite product uh, based on Landsat. So we looked at the current tree ages across the landscape to understand transpiration rates, as well as carbon and nitrogen storage. And then we looked at ownership categories across the watershed in terms of private timber, DNR, forest service, um, and conservation lands. And for the purposes of 
uh, our existing conditions, I'll point out Stewart Mountain Community Forest is right over here in the very northwest corner. It's much of it, it's, it's a proposed effort at this point, but in consultation with um, our partners, we decided to include it just to understand the effects of Stewart Mountain Community Forest. So to run an existing condition scenario in Velma, we needed to approximate existing management to be able to understand where to harvest as we run the model and how often to harvest. Um, and so what we did is we worked on a general scheme to do this that would be approximately realistic, but we note that it's not spatially realistic. We didn't get out stand maps. You know, there's no timber harvest planning that went into this in terms of roads. And, you know, this is very much a broad brush approximation of reality. And so we set up the model so that private, tribal, and conservation lands would have no harvest, um, that timber lands would have harvest every 40 years, except within the riparian management zone to try to represent those riparian buffers that are re uh, required with the Forest Practices Act. Within Washington DNR lands, we did a harvest rotation based on the elevation within the non-excluded areas. So there's a number of excluded areas within DNR lands due to wildlife habitat and other considerations. And within the non-excluded areas, we looked at more frequent harvest at lower elevations and less frequent harvest at higher elevations in consultation with those folks. And on the forest service lands, we did not simulate any harvest. Um, in consultation with the Forest Service folks, there is some possibility for thinning as part of the existing condition scenario, but for the purposes of this pilot project, we put that aside. So we start with that as a baseline, and then we run the model for almost 200 years uh, using historic climate and a loop. And running that, the reason that we are running that in a model as a loop is what we're trying to get to as part of our end member scenarios is getting to a dynamic equilibrium under our existing climate. So if we were to just look at what's going on, you know, in 10 years or 30 years, we may not have reached an equilibrium in terms of the distribution of tree ages on the landscape. And so we run it long time into the future using historic climate, so there's no warming signal here yet, to then extract the values as if we were able to just fast forward and have the tree age distribution that would result from what the disturbance regime we're putting into the model. And on the right-hand side for our existing condition scenario is that tree age map under dynamic equilibrium. So you'll see that our older trees, those blue trees are notably in the national forest, as well as within some conservation lands that are in Skookum Creek where uh, Whatcom Land Trust, the Nature Conservancy and some tribal lands are, and then Stewart Mountain Community Forest, which is proposed is also included here. And then as part of this effort to do extreme end member scenarios to bound that hydrologic response, uh, we went extr as extreme as we could. So again, there's not realism here. We're just trying to put some bounds on it with an all harvest scenario in which we run the model where we harvest every coniferous pixel at a 40 year rotation. So we don't include any no, no harvest areas. And then we also did an old growth scenario where we don't harvest any trees whatsoever. We run it into the future, so we end up with all old trees. And this is where we uh, can pull out those results and start to look at stream flow results. So these are the stream flow results from the South Fork Nooksack River outlet. Um, again, we're looking at flow in cubic feet per second, and we're again looking on a log scale. Um, and this is a median value in this case. So this is from 19 years of simulation. You'll note that the simulations are very similar during the winter and they start to diverge during June, July, August, September, October. And in particular, the green line in the middle is the existing condition scenario. And we see higher flows in the winter as a function of that old growth scenario where it's all old trees transpiring at a lower rate. Whereas we see lower low flows in August and September under that all harvest scenario, the extreme scenario where we rotate all forest on a 40 year cycle. 
And again, we can look at that in box plot form to understand the distributions. And we can see that same pattern with the medians with the highest August flow in the old growth scenario and the lowest in the all harvest with the existing conditions in the middle. And we can also look in table format. I did want to point out as we're looking at old growth versus the existing conditions, we see an increase of about 26%. So one of the questions that we were asking ourselves and one of the reasons to do this end member approach was to understand, will gaps in the snow zone have a larger or a smaller effect compared to forest stand? Like, are they anywhere in the same ballpark? Um, you know, order of magnitude, wise are we anywhere near each other and so it's interesting to start to understand that in fact these two scenarios at their most extreme are in the same ballpark in terms of an effect on august stream flow now one other component that we have been working with with the Velma model is trying to zoom in and understand effects at a reach scale, um, because that's particularly important, for example, to our partners at Wacom Land Trust and folks looking at Stewart Mountain Community Forest to start to understand how changing forest management on those lands might have a effect on summer stream flow. And so in this case, within Lower Skookum Creek, we're zoomed in here, these blue areas this is that tree age map again, our Whatcom Land Trust holdings. Um, and so what we looked at was stream flow between the two red dots. So flow is going from right to left. And in a typical year, in any year, we're gaining stream flow as we go from right to left because we're gaining watershed area. But what we wanted to understand was how, what's that, how much more do we gain if by holding those lands as conservation lands as compared to rotating them at a 40 year rotation cycle. How much water is potentially gained from doing so? And so that's where if we look at this uh, all harvest versus existing conditions that helps us get at that question to say, okay, well, by holding those lands in this existing condition scenario as Wacom Land Trust land, we're seeing a 13% difference in the amount gained over that stretch during August relative to if those areas were harvested. Okay, so everything I've showed you up to now is using historic climate to understand what our baseline maximum effect is. Um, and we also looked at these extreme scenarios in the context of a warming climate. And what we did is we took the same exact model and those scenarios, and rather than running historic climate, we used climate change projections from one general climate model that has been shown to be representative of sort of a middle of the road model for a, um, the RCP 8.5, if you're familiar with climate change models, which is on the more extreme end of emission scenarios. Um, and so, this gives us one snapshot, not a full snapshot of the future, but it starts to indicate what we might expect in the future. So as we're looking at these results in terms of the hydrograph, again, we're looking at a typical year here on the left. The dark colors are that existing condition scenario and that gap 40 scenario that we looked at before. Right now we're looking at the forest gap modeling. Whereas these pale colors are showing us the same scenarios, but under a warming climate. So the most remarkable thing is the tremendous decline in summer stream flows. This is not a surprise um, if you've been following some of the work on this, that we are expecting a 30 to 50% increase, uh, or I'm sorry, decrease in summer flows, 30 to 60% decrease in summer flows uh, in the South Fork Nooksack by the end of the century um, on average. So we've seen that in this model just by the distance of these two um, pairs of graphs. But what we're really interested in is how much of an effect does that gap 40 scenario have on in the future? And if we look at the box plots here, we see that in both cases, the gap 40 scenario has an increase relative to the existing conditions line, but that that increase is diminished into the future. So if we look at, down at the table here under Historic climate, we saw a 25% increase in summer stream flow. Under future climate, 
we're modeling about a 9% increase in August stream flow. So that makes up a little of that gap between current conditions and future conditions, but certainly not the whole thing. But it helps us start to understand how this might play into a larger strategy around climate change adaptation. Okay, and then jumping into the same thing for the Velma modeling to look at the effects of forest harvest. And again, these end member scenarios with all harvest in pink, existing conditions in green, and the old growth in blue. So just like before, the bold colors are the graph that we've seen before uh, in terms of the higher summer flows with the blue old growth and the lowest with that pink existing conditions, whereas these paler colors are under a future climate scenario. So we see, at just as we did with the other model, a decrease in summer flows relative to historic climate. And once again, we see that some of that is buffered with these different scenarios, but certainly not all of it. So under existing conditions, we saw a 26% increase in stream flow with that old growth versus existing condition scenario. In the future, that is diminished to about 11%. So in both cases, we see a decrease in summer stream flow as expected based on previous modeling. And in both cases, we still see an effect from that, uh, those extreme scenarios in terms of increasing summer stream flow, but the, the amount of that effect is diminished in both cases into the future. Okay, so I'm going to just walk through a summary of a few thoughts here um, before we have plenty of time for uh, questions and comments. So key takeaways of this pilot study are first that both introducing gaps in the snow zone and uh, looking at changing stand age across the watershed affect summer stream flow. The direction, those, it, the fact that those are increases is more certain than those absolute magnitudes. As with any modeling exercise, you know, we often look at relative changes rather than absolute changes because of the complexities of the model and the uncertainties of you know, how closely those match reality. Additional refinements to those models are certainly on the radar, um, as well as some sensitivity testing of those models to try to start to put some uncertainty bounds on those values and hone in a little bit more closely now that we have some motivation that there is a substantial effect on summer stream flow. Interesting to me is that there's a similar magnitude for both effects. I really wasn't sure going into this whether we would see, you know, 1% from forest gaps and 50% from forest harvest changes or vice versa. Um, but that in both cases, we see around a 25% increase in August stream flow for the most extreme scenario. One potential thought to chew on is that they are potentially additive in the sense that these scenarios are not mutually exclusive. We could consider putting gaps in the snow zone and also changing some amount of stand age rotation ages, that those the effects are semi-independent. And so there's the capability to do both to potentially have more of an effect, but that they are on very different time scales. So whereas when we're looking at the effects of forest gaps on snow, we're looking at a near immediate effect. If we cut a gap in the forest, we would expect an effect on snow and stream flow effective immediately, depending on having a good snow year. There's gonna be some climate variability there. And certainly there could be some maintenance considerations with that approach. Whereas where we're looking at these forest stand rotation ages and land ownerships and how that might look, we purposefully zoomed into the future to see what does this look like under a dynamic equilibrium in terms of understanding what that might look like incrementally through time uh, is a question that will need to be refined. And I'll also just again emphasize that these are very extreme scenarios. They truly are end members to help provide some sideboards on the hydrologic effect. 
Notably, the effects are smaller than climate change. We're expecting to see a big signal from climate change in the South Fork Nooksack, and certainly this is not indicating that we can make up most or even half of that effect. However, we do see a buffering effect that is noticeable on the order of 10 to 20% relative to the expected reduction. And then lastly, we're thinking already about next steps. We are looking at a phase two modeling effort uh, to get at some of these questions and to continue to work with community partners on what the most important questions are. So um, we are developing that approach right now, but uh, as of today, what we're thinking around are model refinements uh, to include potentially representing thinning of different intensities at a different ages, um, doing some more work on different rotation ages, not just these extreme scenarios, but looking at 40 years versus 80 years or 50 years versus 70 years. So trying to drill down into that, as well as some sensitivity testing to provide more certainty around the model results. A uh, key next step is going to be a development of some realistic scenarios. Um, and in particular, we're looking at working with the folks involved in the Stewart Mountain Community Forest effort there to consider the feasibility and the multiple objectives that are at play in terms of uh, economics, ecological effects, um, and other community considerations. We are looking at uh, expanding our spatial scope um, and including the middle fork and possibly the north fork in a next step. Uh, certainly we would expect some amount of different effects just based on those uh, watersheds having a much more dominant snow component as well as a glacier component to them. And then lastly, a key next step will be to solicit input that anyone here has tonight, as well as from all of our community partners, to think around feedback and ideas and collaboration to direct this effort into being a true applied research effort, where we take that best available science and apply it for the end of really thinking about uh, multi-benefit solutions. So with that, I am looking forward to your questions. I also will point out that um, we just finished the final report and that is available if you want to get in to the nitty gritty details. And I'm really looking forward to um, hearing your ideas and feedback. So thank you. Okay, Susan, that was unbelievable. Just fantastic. Oh my gosh. And I have to say for everybody, the, um, the questions, and then I'm, I also love the answers. You, you, there's a lot of smart people in this room. I'll just start with that. Well done, everybody. And um, so it, it, just to remind you, as part of recording the webinar, the questions and comments also get, uh, get recorded. So you can keep on putting things in. And like Susan said, your feedback tonight will help her think through what the next steps are for this research. I wanted to just actually, before I do move into Q&A, uh, I wanted to show you the website and I wanna give a hats off to John King, High Waters Media, who does our, he just turns things around so fast. So you will see, look, everybody, can you see the screen? Can you see the, the website? Look, there is our evening. And there's Susan's study. It just got put up today. So you can see the full report there. And then we will also put up the, um, the video in pieces. So uh, if, in fact, if you ever wanna go back and look at the climate adaptation plan and there's are the videos from that, and then the other plans that Oliver mentioned, you can find all those on this website. And we'll put that in the chat again, so you can see that but super helpful. And Susan, I just thought you did an amazing job of capturing so much complicated information into a clear way. So here we go. We have um, about half an hour to do questions. And uh, Oliver, you can turn on your video as well, because I'm actually going to start with some questions that were related to yours. We'll kind of go uh, sequentially here. And uh, 
there were so many terms that I think we were all like, okay, I think I know what that means, but will you just say what are legacy impacts, Oliver? Yes. Can you, can you say that to us? Yes. Legacy impacts are impacts on the environment caused by past and present land management. Okay, can you give some examples? Tell us some examples of what that would be. Sure. Um, say, for instance, um, there is a history of removing riparian shading along the river, uh -huh. and that resulted in um, increased um, solar radiation to the river and increased stream temperatures. And so that would be an example of a legacy impact. <laughs> right. We've seen that straight up. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another one for you. You ready? So this was a question about uh, where you, you did a great job of describing between like the, one of the things that's important about the South Fork is we have a lot of non-point source pollution versus point source pollution. What, you know, our, so the question came in of where, where does non-point source pollution mean in the South Fork? Is it is it eroded sediment from logging primarily or from other sources? Like, is that the main one we're thinking about here? Or can you share more? Yeah, so um, the um, non-point sources would include um, increased stream temperature due to the removal of the riparian shading. Okay. Um, and other effects as modeled by Susan, that if you have a reduced amount of late summer stream flow, say due to land management, then less of the active channel is occupied by the, the, the flowing river, but the same amount of solar insulation hits that water. And so there's more heating to um, the river and also because it's shallower, so on and so forth. And so, and so, um, when we talk about non-point source pollution, it's primarily suspended sediment and increased temperature loading. And that's happening both in the, in the floodplain and also from activities in the forest. In the Correct. Okay, Correct. got it. All right, that makes sense. And then the implications of that is, is that the Federal and State Clean Water Act standards are really only have regulatory bite for point sources like outfall from a sewage treatment plant or from a fish hatchery or those would be in fact the only point source i think that the tmdl identified in the nooks in the south fork nooks Act, um, river watershed is from the skookum creek fish hatchery uh-huh okay so and a related question here is that the you mentioned the South Fork Community Watershed uh, or Watershed Conservation Plan would be coming out soon, the, the latest edits to that. And the question came in, who is going to be responsible for implementing that plan? Well, by design and uh, tearing back to the temperature TMDL uh, project, the community. And again, there's no regulatory bite to addressing non-point source pollution. And so it's up to the community or other interesting parties to head up the effort to address non-point source pollution in the South Fork Nooksack River. And keep in mind that um, the issue with pollution in the river is that it's on the, it's category five on the 303 um, list. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so that means that by regulation, the non-point source pollution needs to be addressed. However, the, the tools that are used to address the non-point source pollution can't be um, required by regulation. Okay, so this is going to be a lot of uh, voluntary action, some collaboration, some motivation, maybe some funding. Yeah? Yes. Okay, so everybody, my uh, 68 attendees, that would be you in addition to uh, everybody who's here representing all your different uh, <laughs> lines of work. Good, so we'll look forward, we'll make sure to post that when the watershed plan is done because that, that sounds like it's gonna have a lot of great stuff in it. Okay, so I'm looking at the questions that have come in and I'll kind of take them as I see them in groups. I see a lot about kind of how is this gonna work from a, a timber standpoint, you know, from, from making that feasible. Um, 
And so I think that would probably be the, the conversation at the next forum, like how, how would it happen in a community forest? But there was one that caught my eye that I just asked you, Susan, which is why, why are they, why did you choose those particular sizes and shapes of gap cuts? Like why not strips or, you know, what, how, how'd you come up with those numbers and those sizes? Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, it was a very practical decision. So um, the ability to model gaps uh, currently from a hydrologic model standing standpoint is limited to circular gaps that are smaller than the pixel size resolution that we are working in. So, you know, we could sort of represent strips by taking forest off you know multiple pixels in a row but mm -hmm. what we lose in doing that is that within the gap module we are explicitly representing how tree height gap diameter and time of year in terms of solar angle affect how sunlight reaches the snow and so it is the best representation we have of that physical shading process that's provided by um, the adjacent canopy but um, you know strips brings up a long legacy of some really interesting research starting in the early 1900s looking at cutting strips and cutting gaps and patches and really looking at can we manage the forest to increase annual water yields uh, there's some very impressive photos of that in the literature that I'm happy to share with folks um, we don't yet currently have a great way to model some of those edge effects within the models that we have. In terms of the size, we were really trying to look at an extreme scenario. So we were working in 50 meter gaps. And so we chose a, or a 50 meter pixels. We chose a 40 meter gap so that we would sort of maximize our gap size while also retaining some amount of viable forest in between the gaps. Um, and that equates to about half of the land area being in gaps versus being in the surrounding forest. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so there's a couple questions in here, um, very astute questions about sort of taking the model and then looking at change over time. So, for example, what happens when those when those gaps then grow trees? How, what happens then? And I'm going to read this one from Gordon, um, just directly. Uh, very nice and cogent presentation, Susan. But a key question, it seems to me, is how residual stands either as gaps or harvested units redistribute the water that's made available either as increased snow melt or soil moisture. How well do your models capture this hydraulic redistribution of stand level water be between residual trees and recharge discharge? So how does that exactly happen? And then, like I said, there's other ones about how does that happen over time? Sure. Yeah. Hello, Gordon. Thank you for the great question. Um, so one of the key thing Gordon is getting at here is as we're modeling it at a 50 meter stand, you know, we are looking at putting in a gap and we know from a physical standpoint, if we put in a gap, we're going to get more snow in it. And by having more snow stored longer in the season, that contributes to more soil moisture that is sustained later into the season. But one of the key uncertainties is if you have more soil moisture in the middle of the gap, does the other vegetation adapt through time to use that water? Or does that water really kind of make its way downhill? And the short answer is we don't really know that there's very limited number of actual observations on the ground to get at this. Um, you know, we have some limited observations of snow um, and almost none of soil moisture within GAP. So it's an active research question as to how that water would be redistributed within that pixel size. Um, we do, I mean, the model is sophisticated enough to track water between pixels. So soil moisture in one pixel can move to the next pixel down gradient. But that question of what's happening within the pixel is a key one. As is your question, Holly, around um, regrowth, you know, certainly there is the potential, there will be regrowth of shrubs and ultimately large woody vegetation within that gap. And so one question becomes the, the potential maintenance of that. Um, you know, how does that work through time? And I don't have a good answer for that. The way we modeled it was completely 
basically static. We put in a gap, it remains there for the whole, the whole um, simulation. So there's certainly some research work to be done there to improve that representation. Wow, fantastic, thank you. Okay, here's another. I'm just gonna pull, some of these are complex enough. I'm just gonna read them. Uh, so here's one from Alexander. Can DHSVM be used to model the effects that hydrologic maturity has on modeling winter peak flows? Is there a model that studies road networks and their impact on peak flows? So I think those are kind of two questions. So really what, how can we, because we are interested in both low flows. I think in the South Fork, I can say we're interested in both. We're interested in low flows, yes, definitely. And we're interested in the high flows because we've had these extreme flooding events. Sure. So how can the model help us for both in both directions? Yeah, that's a, a germane question. So um, uh, Bob Mitchell, who I think is uh, listening on, on this call is you know, my, um, one of my co-authors in this work. And uh, he is the one running the DHSVM model out of Western. And he has actually uh, been working with Oliver and um, Holly and others with me a little bit more on the sidelines of looking to apply this model for that very uh, question, which is what is the effect of uh, different harvest frequencies, sizes on peak flow generation. And yes, the DHSVM can represent those processes. Um, in particular, uh, it can represent the canopy interception effect and the soil moisture effect that results from that. Velma is less of a useful tool for that in that regard because it doesn't represent the canopy interception effect explicitly. Um, I will also maybe just throw out there as a preview. I know Bob is working with um, Guillaume Moger, who I think is on this call as well, as well as some other partners on bringing in um, a different meteorological data set that better represents high intensity rainstorms that are driven by atmospheric rivers. Some of those high intensity storms get washed out uh, with the traditional gridded set that we've been using. So uh, yes, it's possible. I think the work is uh, getting initiated uh, pretty much right now. And from a road network standpoint, um, that's a little bit more of a question mark. Um, the model we're using, DHSVM, does have a component, but it is almost, um, it's not very widely used because it's a little bit problematic. Um, so I don't know of a better explicit road network model to use uh, currently. I will say that existing road conditions are sort of baked into the model that we're doing because we're calibrating to observe stream flow, you know, and we, we know we have roads and culverts and drainage ditches in the watershed. The current effect of those is already sort of baked into how we're modeling. But if you were to change that, you know, kind of think about, well, what happens if we decommission roads or change that drainage network? Um, we, our model as currently set up is not set up to deal with that. Got it. Okay. So Oliver, I uh, here's a question that come is coming around um, towards you is uh, really has to do with why could you tell us more why the forest why the uplands are so you feel are so critical right now. I mean we're spending a lot of energy here thinking about upland management as a strategy for the recovery of water resources. And, um, and climate resilience. Tell, tell us, just tell us more why this has been so much of, of your focus. Well, because um, this knowledge gap that we have articulated um, really relates to the upper watershed that is managed for uh, forest resources. And forest resource management is accomplished consistent with both the Northwest Forest Plan on Forest Service administered lands and the Washington State Forest Practices Act on DNR administered lands and private forestry lands. And um, in terms of the Washington State Forest Practices Act, I've indicated that there's no focus on the potential effect of forest harvest on low flows. It focuses a little bit on peak flows but most of the focus in terms of water resources is on water quality. And so since uh, much of the upper watershed is managed for forest harvest and, and 
the Forest Practices Act does not address the effective forest harvest on low flows. And there's a, an assumption that's made in the Forest Practices Act that um, if forest harvest is consistent with the Forest Practices Act, there's no impacts on water quality and quantity. And through uh, various monitoring efforts, so on and so forth, we're finding out that th that assumption is really not reasonable. And now the Forest Practices Act has done a lot to help reduce the impacts of commercial forestry on, on water quality. And it's, it's been a huge improvement over, you know, say 30, 40 years ago. Um, but we should realize that it's not perfect. And one of the weaknesses I see is that it doesn't address um, the effect of forestry on late summer stream flows. Got it. Susan, did you want to, is there anything you want to add to that? Okay. So it, this is, I think, um, Eric just, and by the way, if anybody's tracking the chat, there's been some great sharing of, they, there's been a question, questions asked of, is this happening in other places? And uh, Eric Pickle, I don't know how to say your last name, has said, yes, here and here and here. So if you flip back through that chat, which again, will be in the recording, you can see some other examples of where similar sorts of studies are happening or practices are happening. So, um, but Eric asked this question that I think is really relevant to your last point, Oliver, which is when does a regenerating forest such as a plantation return to a fuller hydrological function, hydrolog yeah, hydrologic function, I said that right. The equivalent clear cut area ECA says that 80% is achieved when the trees are 15 meters tall. And this is obviously really a technical question, so I don't know if that's in your ballywick, but do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I'll just, and Susan, I want Susan to chime in too, but um, my understanding is that the increased transpiration rate of uh, rapidly regenerating uh, forest stands starts to, to um, level off or diminish after about 80 years. And so it really takes 80 years of regeneration for those increased uh, transpiration rates to stabilize and, and level off. And so, and, and of course, um, there's probably some um, continued decrease in transpiration rates after um, 80 years, but I think the dog leg in that graph of transpiration probably happens about 80 years. Susan, do you wanna add or correct to what I just said? Um, no, I would uh, go with the same ballpark. I would just add that it's an active area of research, that there's not that many um, sort of observational studies uh, related to the transpiration rate component of hydrologic maturity. And so uh, there's actively work being done on this too. Great, thank you. Okay, Susan, here's a question. It has to do with uh, gaps. Where's, have gaps been compared? So you've talked a lot about gaps and their and their function. Have gaps been compared on slope and aspect? So different slopes, different aspect. Could you speak to that? Yes. Um, from a snow standpoint, there have been uh, a few studies. I uh, smiled because uh, I'm really excited. There's a study I'm involved with in the Eastern Cascades looking at, at this very question where we have put out uh, time-lapse cameras and remote instrumentation in gaps and thinned forests and non-thinned forests um, in the Eastern Cascades, particularly related to the interest in fire fuels reduction um, and wire wildfire resiliency there. And um, we are finding quite a difference uh, there. And I think it would be um, pretty similar uh, for the, there's only a couple of studies that I can point to. Uh, most of them are modeling studies, but um, where gaps tend to have more of an effect of retaining snow on like north facing slopes, where they get all of the interception, but um, don't necessarily get that sort of direct sunlight that on a south facing slope, even in a gap, you know, you still get a lot of direct sunlight to drive um, 
sublimation and melt. Uh, so there's some fascinating studies. It also depends on um, like climatic conditions as well as the slope. And so there's some really interesting modeling that's work that's been done looking at, you know, how the, the max of the optimal gap size as a function of latitude and cloudiness and um, tree height. So it, it all plays in it together. But what we're seeing in the the, the Eastern Cascades is that there's more of an effect on with um, north facing slopes. That said, in our study here in the Nooksack, uh, from a modeling perspective, we did not see much of a difference. We did run a scenario with all north facing versus all south facing gaps from a modeling perspective, and we saw very little difference between them, um, which I would likely attribute to the fact that we have fairly cloudy conditions during the snowmelt season in the Western Cascades. Uh, and so that deserves some more analysis and attention in the next phase, but um, not a big difference there. Okay, that's good to know. So um, I have a question um, when I was, and it's related to, we're gonna get into so the, some of these fine grain questions uh, in the minutes we have left, but. I remember back when we had our forum with Harriet Morgan on the climate change scenarios. And I'm curious with her scenarios, she had different kind of projections that she laid out and their, and their likely impact. Which kind of projections, I mean, you used a climate lens, the, the worst case scenario, best case scenario, middle case scenario, which scenario did you use, Susan, when you were looking at climate change relative to your model? Yeah, so for our model, we chose one climate projection to use, which I will say is a very simplistic way to do it. Um, yeah. Kind of state of the art is to use an ensemble approach because uh, every climate model, you know, has different internal workings and therefore we can't be real certain of the future. So we try to bracket that. Um, so we just used one. Um, so that's an uncertainty piece. And then we did choose a model that represented end of century conditions and RCP 8.5, the representation, representative concentration pathway 8.5, which is on the, the worst, the worser case, less good case. <laughs> yeah, so perhaps not the most extreme case at this point, but um, so more of a worst case scenario than a middle of the road. Um, uh, typically, folks will also look at sort of mid-century conditions and will often bracket with RCP 4.5, which is a more moderate emission scenario um, into the future. Right. You know, it seems to me, too, I'm thinking back to um, who was the gentleman who pre first presented the TMDL? This was like two years ago. Who was that? From yeah, the, that was uh, Steve Hood. Steve Hood. And he, with the he, Department of Ecology. I think that's kind of one of the things that we're all curious about is just really how fast can we try and improve conditions? Because it was not looking very happy for fish recovery. When you, if you, In fact, his PowerPoint is on our website. But there's a lot of like dead fish pictures, and they're very depressing. Um, but I, I think that's kind of the question, like uh, you know, I'm seeing in a couple of these. Like how fast do you, do you think we can kind of turn things around in terms of being able to restore hydrologic function in the watershed? I know that's an unfair question, but it feels like an important one. Um, I may, maybe Oliver may have more to say on this than I do, but um, I guess from my standpoint, uh, one of the things that we have started looking at and will continue to look at is that sort of time scale of implementation and effect um, where the capability to implement forest gaps, now granted getting that done would not be easy, um, but um, the effect would be almost immediate versus thinking about changing standard rotations or holding different lands uh, into the future. So uh, there, there is some capability to look at what those time scales are and think about like a broader, longer term strategy. Oliver, what, what's your thought? I don't have a whole lot to add, add to, to that, but one thing I, going back to the TMDL and as inferred in um, Susan's research is that the TMDL concluded that even under the best scenario of restoring the riparian zone of the South Fork Nooksack River in terms of offsetting climate impacts, 
at most it would it would maintain the river in the existing condition into the future okay. and the point is it takes more than just riparian restoration to address and offset climate change impacts and that's the other reason for looking at the upper watershed because the convention or the protocol or the convention of most restoration activities is on the water body, the riparian on the floodplain, and that's not going to be enough to offset the effects of climate change in the future. And we have to look at other areas in the watershed that might have something to do with water quality and water quantity, and that's the areas that are actively forest uh, managed for, for forest harvest. Yeah. Yeah, which is why this this work is so important. And I I want to flag too that the the, the um, there's uh, the the questions that are coming out here are so excellent. And Susan, you're going to get a lot of suggestions here for different kinds of things. Like, well, what about this treatment of the forest? And I love that comment about like hydrological maturity is not just about the the age of the trees, right? So there's just I I think that. Um, you know, the complexity of both of your work is so massive. And then our, our beautiful guests here tonight have just given you 100% more. So good job, team. Way to go. <laughs> really, really well done. Okay, there's so many more questions. So I'm, I, I regret we can't uh, take them all. Um, fascinating. I'm going to turn it now. We're on the last slide of our evening. And I'm going to turn it back over to Rosie to wrap it up for us. Let's see if I can possibly do share screen again with all of this. And here we go. And Rosie, you get to do the last, the last thing for our evening and wrap it. Take us home. Thank you. Um, I mean, hopefully everyone is already at home, unless like we sometimes do, you're sitting in your car outside of the library using the internet. Um, but if that's the case, then you can get yourself home soon. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for coming and joining us. This video is going to be available um, on the South Fork Nooksack Community Watershed Project website, which has been in a few times in the chat. But if somebody wants to throw it in there again, just so people have it. Um, that would be great. And then our next forum is going to be in June or July. So um, stay on the lookout if you're on um, the listserv um, already and you got something from MailChimp, then you will hear about it there. If you want to make sure that you hear about those future things, um, maybe what's a good way for people to get in the loop? Holly, anyone? Yeah, actually, if you uh, if you registered for this forum, you'll get an invite to the next. And if you don't want to get an invite to the next, just say no, thank you, and we'll take you right back off the list. So, but I we just take if you register, we just ask you, and it's not like for forever. We're just doing a series of forums, so you'll get invited to those. Perfect. That's thank you. Yeah. And then the next one is going to be about Stewart Mountain Community Forest, which is that initiative that um, Oliver and Susan both spoke to a bit. Um, and so it should be really exciting. Stuff is happening. Um, yeah. And so much gratitude to all of you for showing up and for your really amazing, thoughtful questions. Um, yeah, that was an incredible discussion and um, hopefully has given us all a bunch to think about. If you learned something super interesting, share it with someone else and that will help you remember it. Um, thank you, Oliver and Susan, for everything you shared with us. That was fantastic and I'm excited for more. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening and I hope you all get some good rest tonight. Thank you.